Well, greetings, Bereans, and welcome to another recording of Life and Doctrine. And today we are going to talk about biblical separation. So maybe if you're from a very um, super conservative or even uh, legalistic background and you hear degrees of separation, you kind of cringe because it brings up some bad memories where you were brought up to believe um, that, you know, there's barely in aso any association with the world and um, a certain type of clothing and never go to movie theaters. And so some people have that kind of baggage when they think of separation. Or maybe you've just never heard of it before. What is, what is separation? Well, the doctrine of separation is recognizing the biblical teaching that we are to be separate from the world. And I cannot tell you how incredibly important and vital this is for the child of God to understand and to fully embrace. I mean, right from the Old Testament, God calls out Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and they are marked by distinction and difference from the world, obviously in all the areas of holiness. So when it comes to sexual morality, when it comes to honesty, all those things, you are to be different from the world. But God even ha had them uh, show some differences in things that would initially not make a whole lot of sense, like stairs versus a ramp, you know, to go up to the temple. The pagans have one, you're supposed to have the other. Uh, just doing all these various detailed ways in which Israel was to be totally different from the surrounding nations, driving home this major point that every detail of your life is to radiate with the glory of Christ and be absolutely and totally different from the world. And that is equally true, maybe expressed differently, not in a Jewish cultural expression or a Mosaic law expression, but equally important, equally as vivid when it comes to the church in the New Testament. God's desire for the church is to look and live differently and distinct from the world so that when the world looks at the church at large, looks at the individual Christian, that Christian looks radically different from them. And maybe that difference is intriguing and it compels the world to ask, wow, you know, why are their marriages so much more peaceful and why are they more humble and quicker to, to confess their sins? Or maybe aspects of those differences are off-putting. Wow, a, a Christian won't even do that or go there. What do they think? They're holier than us, you know? And um, maybe it causes them to be more derogatory. Really, their reaction to our separation is none of our business. Our business is to trust God when he tells us it is distinction and differentiation from the world that is his will and that if he so chooses to win the world to himself is going to be a primary tool, is going to be the difference that the world sees in us. Maybe a difference that originally offended them, but then through the Holy Spirit wins them to Christ and to the church. So our job is to be different from the world. Um, and I could furnish many, many examples of how, um, I guess it's always been present throughout history, certain levels of antinomianism, and I can live how I want. But even in, in our day and age, even in some of the, of the reform circles, um, justifying foul language or crass uh, joking or um, um, a little more than just social drinking, but too much of a lifestyle and association, with alcohol, the bar scene, various things like that, uh, things that I think move beyond just a gray issue and just look like worldliness at the end of the day. And it's becoming very epidemic in certain uh, areas of the church. And so we really need to have a heart for biblical separation. It's just a fact of Scripture. We read in Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We're not supposed to whisper of things done in darkness. We're to expose them, okay? Uh, James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses. Now, he doesn't say adulterers and adulteresses. He calls us adulteresses because we are married to Christ, okay? But yet when we live with the world, we are being unfaithful to Christ. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I mean, those are the strongest terms 
that James could possibly use. You want to be an enemy of God? Well, just be inappropriately, wrongfully, friendly with the world. Now, we'll get into this. He's not talking about being kind and nice and friendly in the sense of, of um, sacrificing ourselves and loving the world. He is talking about being unequally yoked with the world, where they cease to be the mission field and we enter into an element of worldliness for our own personal um, appeasement. And that kind of friendship is categorically offensive to God. And he's telling us, you've lined yourself up as an enemy of God. So that's scary language. And if we have a sensitive conscience, we do not want to th- cross that threshold, right? I don't want to be seen in an unbiblical sense a friend, that kind of friend of the world. So you have examples of this. One of the classic examples, of course, is Daniel. When Daniel is taken captive and he is, uh, becomes one of the wise men, the courtiers of, um, of Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, the, the Babylonian ruler, um, he, I might have got my kings mixed up there, but one of the things that Dan- it says in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 1.8, is he resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. So he, wa- he, he knew the Mosaic law. He was under obligation to obey the Mosaic law. And the Babylonian government really didn't care about the Mosaic law. You will eat this kind of food. But he refused to defile himself. Defiling was disobeying God because a governing authority told him to do something that disagreed with God. So, so he refused to defile himself. He had to maintain biblical separation from these um, defiling items, even though he was in a completely different culture and a completely different government. And so we see plenty of, exa- of examples like this throughout the Bible. So why is the fact, the biblical fact of biblical separation absolutely necessary? As I mentioned a little bit, 1 Peter 1.13 tells the church, just like it told Israel, you are to be holy, for I am holy. The, the, the reason we are to be separate from the world is that we are to maintain visible and practical holiness before an onlooking world. We want the world to think that we live and think very differently, very godly, but very differently than they do, okay? Uh, and, and not just different for difference sake, but a difference that reflects godly difference, God's difference, the character of God. So maintaining that holiness. A lot of times, uh, you know, when, when a, a philosophy of min- ministry is being forged within a church and they're thinking, how can we reach the culture? Holiness and distinction from the culture gets thrown out and the church starts essentially asking the question, how can we look more like the culture to make people feel more comfortable? So they'll come into our church or come into our fellowship. How do we look less like a group of holy people before God and more like the world? And maybe they don't realize they're asking that question, but because biblical separation is not kept at the center, it's not motivating, okay, How can we accommodate the world without losing biblical separation should be uh, the question. And when I say accommodate the world, I don't mean accommodate the sinful system of the world, but how can we serve our community without compromising holy and distinct separation? So we have to maintain holiness. That's the first reason. The second reason why biblical separation is necessary is for personal purity. If we are to progress in sanctification, we have to be honest about the susceptibility of our flesh, right? We are susceptible to temptation. And when we sort of keep moving the fence back when it comes to personal holiness and separation, when we just continue to fudge with the limits of separation, we are opening ourselves up to more temptation and human beings Yes, even Christian human beings, of course, are, are notorious for getting sucked into temptation. We're in this fallen flesh. And so some of it is just for our own good. Besides being distinct from the world, it's just for our own good. So those are the two primary reasons why the Christian needs a theology of biblical separation. So 
what would be some of the grounds for separating? And we're, uh, it could be uh, ecclesiastical separation, so certain churches or denominations we should not associate with. Um, it might be a particular uh, co-worker that um, we probably shouldn't hang out with after work um, or depending on what we do with this person, um, whether the relationship is becoming too close or whether it's, it has ceased to be evangelistically driven. Where's the boundary? Okay, so we might be talking about people. We might be talking about churches. We might be talking about false teachers. Uh, we might be talking about um, certain kinds of movies. There's all different ways in which biblical separation can take form. So here are several grounds for biblical separation. The first one is it is obviously evil. We, we, we disassociate, we separate ourselves from something, someone, when it is obviously evil. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 17, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. So when I say obviously evil, I mean the thing is clearly wrong in the sight of God. For a believer to date or marry an unbeliever is about the most unchristian thing a believer can do. Paul has already said, whatever you join yourself to, you join Christ with. You're in Christ. You're one with Christ. But yet you're going to join yourself to someone in a close relationship. And the only reason for dating is to see if they can if they eventually would make a good spouse, you're going to join yourself to them in a close romantic relationship and then possibly eventually in a marriage relationship with someone who's not one with Christ, who hasn't given themselves to Christ. I mean, that just flies in the face of any basic good Christian desire that a Christian should have. They should want to be one with and spend the rest of their life with someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. It's almost crazy to even have to make the case. If I love Christ, of course I want to marry someone who loves Christ. Um, so that seems to be the most obvious application here. But he says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. So there's that word separate for biblical separation. Be separate from them. So um, that's a pretty clear verse, right? It's hard to get that wrong. Um, the only question then remains, okay, what situations would constitute being unequally yoked, okay, with an unbeliever. Uh, so here's a test question. Does the nature of the relationship require that both parties agree on a set of biblical principles to fulfill your task in a manner that's honoring to the Lord? Okay, let me say that again because that's a long sentence. Does the nature of your relationship require that both parties agree on a set of biblical principles to fulfill your task in a manner honoring to the Lord? So not all relationships are equal, right? If I want to get together with my neighbor and unsaved neighbor and go around and shovel driveways, you know, um, obviously we don't need to agree on a biblical set of principles to um, to get it done in a way that, that honors the Lord. That's just some basic cooperation. You might um, uh, be an employee at work and you might serve on committees or, or whatever it is or, or various boards and um, you can accomplish the agenda, the goal of the company uh, or the, the, the jurisdiction that you're given um, by cooperating with unbelievers. It happens all the time. But it's um, agreed upon by a large amount of Christians that when you kind of up the bar a little bit and you become co-owners with an unbeliever, well, now there's a whole lot more biblical principles that begin to um, come into play, okay? There's the ethics and there's, there's um, I mean, I have a whole book on how, what a Christian businessman should look like. And the, 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 the more you get kind of to the top and the more you begin to, to control the whole direction of a company, the more you're going to want um, or the more necessary it becomes to operate according to these major biblical principles. Now, 
even if you're a, a low-level employee, you, of course, have an obligation before God to operate according to biblical principles. But um, when you are given oversight over a large company and then someone else, it becomes your equal in that oversight, it gets a whole lot more difficult if both people are unsaved. So I'm not going to draw an exact line and say when you become unequally yoked. But the point is, the closer and the more complex that relationship gets, the harder it's going to be to kind of be together in the harness um, where one person is not operating in a biblical worldview when it comes to business, but you are. Um, so you need to ask the question, the, the relationship, whatever it is, and I'm not talking about a dating or a romantic relationship because that's kind of a no-brainer. It's absolutely out of bounds for the Christian. But if it's a business relationship or whatever it is, ask yourself, do I need to agree to a significant degree with this other person on certain biblical principles to fulfill my task in a way that honors God? And if I do, but yet they don't, well, now we're starting to move in the territory of being unequally yoked. Um, so these are just discernment issues, wisdom issues that we need to think through. Um, here's another test question, okay? Um, if I told, um, so this is, this is talking about more like friendship relationships. So maybe you, ha you are a friend with uh, an unbeliever, and so you're watching this and saying, okay, uh, am I too close with this unbeliever? Has it has it changed to a, a relationship of, of being unequally yoked, okay? I'm just talking about a good old-fashioned platonic uh, friendship. So here's a test question to check that out. If I told this person that the sole purpose of my friendship is to win them to Christ, would they be shocked? If so, then you are probably in need of separation. So maybe it's someone, you have a lot of hobbies together, you, you ride motorcycles together, whatever it is, and you spend a lot of time with this unbeliever, if you were to look at them and say, hey, I, I love you, and because I love you, I have to tell you this. The sole reason for my friendship with you, I mean, I love you as a person, and, I, you know, and we're close. We go way back, but the sole reason for my relationship with you and my greatest burden is that you come to know Christ. Would that shock them, or would they be, well, yeah, you've made that clear all along. If that would shock them, then that could be an indicator that the relationship is not an evangelistic relationship. Because really, when it comes to Christians and unbelievers, there's a mission field and there's the church, right? There's no middle ground. You don't have a third kind of friendship. You're trying to win someone to Christ or you're a brother and sister in Christ fellowshipping with another brother and sister in Christ. And so if they've shifted in some third category where you're no longer, it's obviously, it's not apparent to them that you're, that you're trying to win them to Christ, then it could be that you are enjoying commonalities in sort of a secular fashion without the gospel being front and center. I remember years ago, uh, I, was, I was becoming very convicted with someone I was becoming close with, um, and I knew that they were an unbeliever. And so I, I said to this person, do you know that the reason <laughs> that I, I'm your friend is to see you come to Christ. And indeed, it was an offense to them, a, a shock to them, and, and they were a little bit off-put um, by it. Um, but it was a good gauge. It was a good gauge for me to kind of check the nature of my relationship with them. So that might be something. I, it's obviously wrong before God, and we need to back out. A second grounds for separation is just to avoid temptation. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Okay? So maybe technically there's nothing wrong with the event that you want to go to, something that you want to participate in, whatever it is, there, you have a clear conscience. But at this event or in this situation that you involve yourself in or this place that you like to go, are there multiple opportunities of your flesh to be tempted? Especially if the things tempting your flesh are things that in the past you have struggled with or in the past you have fallen for, then <laughs> it becomes pretty clear that for the sake of purity, purity and holiness is far more important than you going to this event or you participating in this thing. It becomes very clear for the sake of my personal sanctification, 
because it grieves my heart to think of breaking God's heart and falling back into some of these sins. I'm going to avoid this situation. Okay, so that's the test question. Does the situation person provide temptations to my flesh, especially temptations that I have failed to resist in the past? And then wisdom would say, well, don't put yourself. That's what the Bible verse says. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't dangle the meat in front of your flesh and tempt it. Just walk away. Stay away from it. Develop new places to go, new things uh, to do. A third reason why we might engage in biblical separation is to not unnecessarily offend a weaker brother. We have to remember, especially if we are members, as is the will of God, members in a local church, that our actions just do not affect us. They affect anybody else, any other brother or sister in Christ who's going to hear about it. And so a lot of people think that as long as I can justify it in my mind, as long as it's you know, clearly in Scripture it's a gray issue and I don't have any defiled conscience, well, that's the only criteria by which I discern if I can involve myself into this particular activity or situation, location, whatever. But it's not. You are part of a spiritual family that is related by the blood of Christ. And within a church are new believers, uh, new believers who might be coming back from abusing or being a victim of the background or of the situation that you are about to waltz into and say, well, I have a clear conscience, it's perfectly fine. And it might really confuse them and really be a stumbling block to them. Paul says very strongly in Romans 14, 15, for if because of food your brother is hurt, remember he's talking about meat offered to idols, uh, it's technically okay to eat meat offered to idols, but if you're sitting there and your brother in Christ is a new Christian who came out of this idolatry background, who has such a sensitive conscience, and you know it's going to send their head spinning, it'd be wrong for you to say, well, I technically know there's nothing wrong with it, and then just start gobbling it up because, hey, you got a clear conscience. Wait, you're not loving your brother. So he says, for if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Do not take your little Christian liberty and say, well, there's nothing wrong with it, and then destroy that weak brother or sister in Christ who has so freshly come out of that background. Notice he's not talking about somebody who's legalistic, who's offended at everything. He's talking about a person who's really trying to grow, but he hasn't grown to the point where he can say, as Paul says, we know there's no such things as idols, so I can eat this just fine. He hasn't gotten to that point yet, okay? Or he might just have a different kind of conviction. You know, there's plenty of very strong Christians who have stricter convictions on certain things that we do. So it's not that they're necessarily weaker or spiritually more immature than we are. They just have a stricter conviction. And if I can sacrifice a basic Christian liberty so as not to put a stumbling block at their feet or create an offense or something for them to get over... Well, then obviously, if my love for my brother is greater than my love for myself, then I'm going to forego that Christian liberty, okay? So the qu text, test question, do I know a sincere brother who will be confused and struggle with my associations? If, um, if a brother or sister in Christ in the church that I've covenanted with were to find out what I'm doing, would that be a severe stumbling block to them? If so, I love my brother more than I do my little Christian liberty, all right? And by the way, that's, that's the principle behind Paul's command to become, or Paul's example of becoming all things to all men. Becoming all things to all men meant he's willing to sacrifice what he needs to sacrifice to become all things to all men. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to go, um, you know, flirt with the devil and play around with the world in order to become all things to all men. No, he's talking about dying to himself, in order to serve others with the gospel. A fourth reason why we might engage in biblical separation is if they claim the name of Christ, oh yes, I'm a Christian, and then they live immorally. Okay, They trample underfoot the blood of Christ by the way that they live. So 1 Corinthians 5.11, Paul says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And in that same context, he says, uh, just remember, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about those, thi those people who don't claim to follow Christ. Uh, obviously, they're the mission field. Go, be amongst them in a way that still preserves biblical separation, but be amongst them like Jesus was, you know. 
and share the gospel. But if one of them maintains, if they can articulate the gospel, um, I think there's a lot of people today that call themselves Christians who can't even articulate the gospel. You know, so sometimes I don't view them in this particular category. But if they claim to be c- to know Christ, they can articulate a gospel so that it's clear in their mind, they know better, but yet they still run with the world, then don't have anything to do with them if you care about the glory of Christ. Um, and that doesn't need a qu- test question because that's, that's pretty apparent. We can all recognize someone who can articulate the gospel, knows Christ, but they're living, or claims to be a believer, but lives like the world, okay? Separate from them. Or if they deliberately deny the nature of Christ. That's the fifth reason and the last reason why we should separate from someone. Second John 1, verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, he just got through teaching on uh, the deity of Christ, the nature of Christ, being sent from the Father, and, and that goes back to the, the first letter of First John as well, knowing that he's been sent from the Father. So really, when you kind of glean all the information, it's a biblical understanding of the Trinity, okay? The nature of the Father, the nature of the Son, the nature of the Holy Spirit. If someone comes to you rejecting that teaching, of course, there's a heavy emphasis on the nature of Christ, Do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Okay? Um, Now, this is an important verse where we understand not the letter of the law but the spirit of the law. A greeting he's talking about. He's not saying don't say hi to a Mormon. (laughs) He's saying do not engage in the kind of behavior that would communicate to the Mormon or to the person who is rejecting the nature of the Godhead, the deity of Christ, that you are cool with him, that you are accepting him. Don't even invite him into your house. The idea is, oh, come over and have some fellowship, and yeah, let's have a meal, let's pretend that what you're doing is not incredibly egregious to God, and that makes you a sworn enemy of the one true God. He's, he's talking about things that would communicate to these people denying the nature of Christ that there's nothing wrong. Um, obviously if a Jehovah's Witness or someone knocks on your door, there's nothing wrong with sitting them down on the couch in your living room in order to confront them with what the Word of God really says, okay? So I've heard people say that. Don't even allow them into your house. Well, what's the point behind what he's saying? In the the Jewish culture, the reason why you you greeted people and the reason why you had people come in, the reason why you gave them meals, it it was very rich and intimate fellowship. So don't, don't have this kind of fellowship, give this kind of sign of approval to someone who is a false teacher now, um, or someone who's denying the deity of Christ. Now, we could go to other passages, kind of balloon this point out and talk about the fact that this applies to all false teachers. And this is where the degrees of separation come in. So if there's a person, a false teacher, who is absolutely denying orthodoxy, then I have an obligation to not associate with them. It's, It's the same principle here. I have an obligation to separate from them. Now, second degree separation says that if there's a pastor friend of mine who does associate with a false teacher, second degree separation says, well, not only do I not associate with a false teacher, but now I don't associate with my friend because he associates with a false teacher. So it's second degree remove, and then you go third degree. Now, when I look at scriptures on biblical separation, especially when it comes to false teachers, I don't see any mandate for second degree separation. For example... So um, I don't know if this, this will surprise anyone or not. If you're kind of paying attention to the ebb and flow of the evangelical world, it probably won't. But uh, I enjoy John Piper's preaching. I enjoy his teaching. I enjoy a lot of his, uh, his um, expositions. But I believe that in the past he has, and in the present, he has associated uh, with false teachers. People have done great damage to the church. I think there's a severe lack of judgment. I can't imagine, I can't get into his mind. I can't know why he does what he does. Uh, but I think there's a very severe lack of judgment that's, that's there. So he stands before God. He's going to have to give an account for that. And there's obviously a degree of approval that he gives to these false teachers. When he was a part of the Toronto Blessing, things like that, there's some approval that he extends to that. But I do not believe then that the Bible mandates a kind of second degree separation. Well, because he associated, well, then I can have nothing to do with his books, nothing to do with his preaching, must warn everybody. Because it's kind of like a domino effect. If second degree separation is true, then third degree. So um, 
if I associate with, uh, with the writings of the preaching of John Piper, then anybody who associates with me is now corrupt because I associate with him because he associates with someone. So you can get really ridiculous. And so I think we have to be careful. We have all these degrees of separation, um, and then we get into this kind of, uh, we just become uh, contrarians and naysayers, and we become isolated, and everybody except, you know, some you know, people who can count on one hand is suddenly of the Lord. I think it can spin out of control really fast. So I- it's, it's up to people's discernment to decide, <laughs> um, well, to look at scriptures and see does scripture mandate a second degree separation. All I can see based on passages like 2 John 1, 10 and 11, there's a few others that I'm not going to take the time to go into, but it's talking specifically about first degree separation. But all that, all that to say, um, as Christians, especially Christians who are members of a local church who are representing a holy God to a community, we need a theology of separation. This needs to be very important. We can't allow that this doctrine might have been abused by legalistic churches of the past. We can't allow that most people don't even think about this anymore. They just kind of do what they want unless it's you know, obviously egregious. No, we need to have a more specific line in the sand, a degree of separation for the sake of our own personal purity and to maintain the appearance of a holy church who reflects a holy God before an onlooking world. So that is the doctrine of separation.